so fast, like nothing we'd ever expected. The high is a lie, and the high makes a liar out of the user. I threw up, man, my guts. And as I'm throwing up, I'm like, damn, boy, this is what I want. And it drives me insane. I was going crazy. Just see a store and buy a pack of gum. It's crazy. So many people. It's everywhere. I never thought I would be like with the heroin. Never, ever. Once you're hooked and you're on it, it there's no turning back. So that's what you do back. Sweet dreams. Across the country, an old drug is making a frightening comeback. With an alarming speed, heroin is fast becoming a popular drug for a whole new generation of users, American teens. Heroin has wormed its way out of the inner city hell holes, across manicured lawns and two-car garages right into homes like yours. Like a sniper with pinpoint accuracy, heroin is picking off a new generation of sons and daughters. Opiate abuse has been around throughout most of our human existence. And in many eras, it wasn't considered abuse and was openly accepted for use in different societies and cultures. Written records indicate that opium was used by Greeks around the 3rd century BC. During the American Civil War, many soldiers became addicted and it was often called the soldier's illness or army disease. This is nothing new. Opiate addiction and the use of opiates have constantly changed throughout our history to the present day. With medical advancement, opiate use and application has changed. With these changes came abuse and social issues. Opium is the source of all opiate drugs, heroin, codeine, and morphine, and it's obtained from the opium poppy plant. Opium is the milky latex fluid contained actually in the unripened seed pod of the poppy plant. Opiate abuse continues to mutate, and society is constantly playing catch up with accepted uses and how to deal with the addicts. When we started to see um, over drug overdose deaths, we started to see heroin being seized on a regular basis by our, our street officers. We started to get a growing number of complaints of diverted pharmaceuticals like Oxycontin from pharmacies, from physicians' offices. If you have an opiate abuse issue, uh, whether it be heroin or prescription opioids or a combination of the both, you will see an increase in crime. Opiate cases, heroin cases, um, we're seeing a lot more property crimes. Uh, I would estimate that between alcohol and drugs, probably 90-95% of our cases have some involvement with intoxicants. This was present prior to the influx of heroin into our area. There were all these symptoms out there. The overdoses were one of them, but all of these other things, you know, thefts increased from the mall and from shopping centers. Our number of uh, bad check cases increased. You know, burglaries where people either were stealing cash or things that they can convert to cash. Burglaries, I've broken into houses, stolen checks and used them, prostitution. It goes from something so simple, a petty theft, to I was selling my body. An opiate addict is a desperate person, and they usually start their commissions of crimes uh, with loved ones, against loved ones. I didn't care who I hurt. I didn't care who I had to steal from to get it. I stole from my boyfriend, who was a heroin dealer. Stole thousands of dollars worth of heroin. Although in my head, you know, I loved these people so much, but I couldn't stop doing what I was doing, no matter what. But when I was living away from them, I 
wasn't making enough money to really get high. So it was when I moved back in with them and was able to rob everyone blind. <laughs> I was busted at my mother's house, burglarizing it. Wow, what am I, you know, what am I doing to my mother? There were times when I did, when I would hear her crying in the next room or, you know, and it would affect me, but then I'd just brush it off and be like, let me get high, you know. Parents or relatives don't want to accuse another relative of victimizing them. And even if they do know that that happened, uh, they would be embarrassed about reporting that to anybody else. The alcohol thing has been around for a long time, but the, uh, the problem with, with the opiate offenses is we're getting a class of person, usually it's a young person, often a 20-something, who never ever would be in the criminal justice system, but for the fact that they have this opiate addiction. These people are interested in fast cash, um, and therefore they'll take jewelry or items like that that they can pawn. It's a frightening wake-up call that no family should ignore. Opiates are a huge epidemic here. Huge. I never, ever, ever imagined me doing anything of that kind. This was a lot of young people supplying each other at parties is how this got going in this community. I think that really shaped who we ended up having in our treatment programs. Young people are so impressionable. Freshmen are so impressionable. You know, they just, all they want is to fit in. You taking drugs tonight? There's no doubt in my mind, you know, drugs and, and alcohol have always been a problem uh, in schools. Drug dealers are murderers. The chemicals that they push kill people. I think as the word is getting out that opiates are a different kind of drug, this is not alcohol, it's not marijuana, it's something that will basically steal your choice away. Oxycontin, heroin, Percocet, everything. It's huge at Brewer High School. You wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see it just by looking in. Being a student, you know what's there. It's everywhere. It's in high schools, it's in middle schools. Sometimes even elementary school students are using it. It's really important that we educate our kids. I'm a real believer in having more information is better than not. The ordinary sneaker. And then inside is the hide. This is it's a socket. But it's a pop pipe. Just your regular lipstick. However, inhalants, yeah, coughing, bad news. Real bad news. Pot pipe. If you look close, punched out the C and then the, then the hole. They're unsmoked. And also one filter is shorter than the other. Persons will use a cutoff filter in lieu of uh, cotton if they're desperate. So it'll cut a cigarette filter off and wrap it, put it in the spoon, heat up the, the drug, and then use the, use the cigarette filter as a mechanical filter as, to separate the liquid from the, from the drug. In about the fifth or the sixth grade was the first time that they used booze and tobacco. The eighth grade was about the time that marijuana was being abused. Or eighth or ninth grade was the time that diverted pharmaceuticals, mostly Ritalin, was being abused. And from there, it progressed to the prescription painkillers, ultimately to Oxycontin, then to heroin, and later on cocaine. And this is all within the high school years. Low self-esteem is a major contributor that can make children more at risk for trying drugs when they're older. It could be anything from childhood, um issues such as molestation, they could be outcasts, they could be they don't fit in, or that they have issues with their parents, anything. God love these kids that have to grow up in this time anyway. This is a rugged, rugged time for healthy kids, never mind kids that are wounded. As parents today, we need to be aware that any young person is at risk for becoming involved with substance use and abuse. Generally, heroin would not be the first drug that a young person would take or try. Well, the average age of initiation into opiate addiction right now, into opiate usage right now, is 12. That's the largest growing group of people. So you've got to start awfully early, and you've got to give the right message. When I was 13, um, I started using prescription drugs that weren't prescribed to me with my friends. My first was Ritalin. Percocet, Vicodin, Darvacet, anything, codeine, anything I could get my hands on. 
When we want to know how prevalent drugs are in our communities, look to the high school. High school kids do not have the means or the resources to go out and procure drugs. Therefore, if they can get their hands on a certain class of drug, that means that there's a lot of it out there. That means it's accessible and it's available. One of the reasons that we are seeing increases in the number of people who are willing to try heroin for the first time are in fact that they may already be an opiate addict, uh, addicted to uh, pain medications. I think the gateway was probably knowing the feeling of um, opiates, of prescription drugs. Uh, if you snorted it, it had a greater cross social appeal because everyone equated needle use with being a junkie. Uh, if we could snort this drug like we were snorting other drugs, uh, therefore it became more acceptable, more people were apt to try it. And the other factor was that heroin was significantly cheaper. Anyone who will use opiates recreationally one time will probably do it two times. Anybody who will do it two times will probably do it four times the spiral starts rolling. It's not so much to look for the red in their eyes, but look for the depression in their lives. I think it's um, important to talk about uh, behavior change, any kind of change in behavior. Changes in sleep patterns, if they participate in things and then they stop, that it's not heroin, it's anything leading up to heroin, any behavior change that's significant. It came on so strong and so fast that by the time we realized there, were, there was a problem, that was pretty well entrenched uh, in this community. Um, you know, reports of stolen prescription pads. So we, I think collectively, we started to gather the stories, you know, in and around the city of Bangor and comparing notes. And I think then we started to realize that everybody was starting to get this, so there was something going on. A lot of times changing uh, quantities, uh, changing dates, um, or even the strength of a drug. Um, Sometimes it's not obvious, but based on what you typically see the doctor write for, if that seems odd to you that he typically doesn't write for that certain type of strength or that certain quantity, um, you may uh, have cause to question the prescription. Uh, you know, a lot of times when people are dropping off prescriptions, the pharmacist isn't the one taking that prescription in. So it's the technicians at the end windows that you need to kind of educate and um, and talk to about communicate on a daily basis. Any of the prescription opioids have a propensity for abuse. Um, the benzodiazepines, the mild tranquilizers, are commonly diverted and abused. A lot of people don't believe that I'm an addict. Nobody really knows how it happens. It's not like you say, I want to grow up and be a drug addict someday. That's my goal. It's nobody's goal. It just kind of happens. This disease does not discriminate. I was a straight A student, a cheerleader came from a good family. It doesn't make you a bad person, it just happens. I didn't think I would ever like have a real problem with it. I thought I would just hang out with my friends, and smoke pot and drink or whatever on the weekends, things like that. But after a while it got worse and I started doing it more. And then I started doing it by myself. It led me into other drugs. It's like a doorway. Because once I started and then it wasn't enough and I did more. I also smoked crack, hash, angel dust. Everything. I never thought I would be like that. I would have this little pill holder. I would just accumulate. It would get right full. And eventually, if I was jonesing, I would take everything in there. And I had no idea what they were. There were usually benzos like Xanax, Klonopin, um, stuff like that, Valium. Those were always my backup plan. Every day until I discovered heroin. Heroin was stronger, it was faster, <clears throat> and it was cheaper. We had a program that we presented to pharmacists, um, things to look out for, for people who were trying to divert drugs, you know, um, forge prescription pads, so that would raise their awareness that, that there was something going on. We had a program for physicians, encourage them to be wise to what was going on, not necessarily not to trust the patients, but just to maybe um, make a more thorough examination. Antibiotics have been abused. We've seen sleep aids abused. Society's impression of heroin is so horrible that they think, you know, well, it's not that bad, I'm doing Oxycontin. It's just a pill, it's not heroin, but in reality it is. There are folks who are inclined to take risks. Uh, there are folks who have addictive personalities, who perhaps don't quite understand what they get into. I knew what prescription drugs were like, and, uh, and somebody said, oh, this blows that away.
And so I tried it, and I liked it a lot. And that's where I guess it started. I was an addict from day one, even with marijuana and alcohol. So when I found heroin, I clung right to it. About a week into use, I had to have it, emotionally and physically. Physically, it was easier to get addicted because it took care of my emotional. When we started to see um, overdoses come into the hospital of kids, high school kids, um, we started to see overdose deaths of high school kids, and we started to get reports from schools and uh, of things going on in the schools, I think we all took a step back and said, you know, we really need to do something here to get the word out. But opiates in general, be it heroin or prescription drugs like Oxycontin, aren't a drug that you can make a few bad choices with regard to the use and then one day wake up and say, geez, that's a bad idea, I don't think I'll do that. You know, Oxycontin is synthetic heroin. It's clean heroin. Because the difference between Oxycontin and heroin in terms of how it affects your brain chemistry and whether you get addicted or not is, is zero. There isn't any difference. It's going to do the same thing to you. I thought it took a long time for people to get to the point where they used heroin. An Oxycontin pill which getting into what oxycotton is, is, is the base ingredient is oxycodone, which has been around a long time. All that they did is they beefed up the dosage and they put a time release um, on that pill. That goes for about a dollar milligram. So an oxy 80 milligram pill is going to cost you between 80, uh, perhaps even up to 95 dollars, depending upon what the, what the current uh, market conditions are for that. A bag of heroin in our area would cost anywhere between 25 and 40 dollars a bag. So when heroin came in, based upon the purity level, based upon the cross appeal that it had, uh, and based upon the economic savings that it offered people, uh, they made the jump rather easily. I thought heroin was something that happened in empty storehouses in New York City, empty vacated apartment buildings in big cities, alleys, gross bars. I thought it was a grown-up thing. I thought it was a city thing. And those of us who thought that were dead wrong. And law enforcement has to understand if you don't see heroin in your area, say you're in Louisiana, it may still come there. You have college campuses in your area. People bring their drug of choice, and especially now when you're dealing with a drug that's highly addictive, such as heroin, they're going to have to bring their, their drug of choice down to the campus. These drugs, not just heroin, but other ones, may infiltrate your entire college community, and all it takes is one person bringing in their addiction to your area. The reason why there are so many young people these days has to do with the fact that it's become sort of chic, that they really thought that if they snorted, they were less likely to get addicted. But what nobody told them was how addictive and deadly the substance is, regardless of how you take it in. If I had to do it with a needle, I would not have done it at first, because I, I had the same point of view on needles as I did on heroin. Just over time, my inhibitions had slowly decreased. Danielle was always very against drugs. Uh, Danielle was afraid of needles as a child. I don't know anybody that's really jumped right into to, uh, injecting. Most people snort it you know and at first it's oh i won't get addicted there's no way i'll get addicted i won't even let myself get addicted but then a year down the road you're injecting everybody's talking about heroin everybody wants to do heroin so what is the the, the kid 14 15 year old when he goes out what does he ask for hey let me try that heroin that he hears so much about you know to him that's living on the edge this is not an easy time to be a child heroin is the up-and-coming chic drug it's not about a handful of junkies shooting up in urban ghettos and back alleys anymore. This is America's problem. Battling the demons of addiction, teetering on the edge of destruction. The biggest decision not too long ago faced by students was what to wear and who to date and what college to attend. But more and more kids will not have that chance to make those decisions. They've already made a fatal one. It was one of those highs where you liked it but you didn't like it. It was kind of like you wanted to come down soon because it just, it had more control over you than you did. But for some reason, you went back to it. A kid on heroin has only got two ways to get off of heroin. That is treatment or, or death. death. Many times I almost died. Didn't stop me, though. 
I mix different drugs that you're not supposed to mix. I was doing eight bags a day. When she was looking good, we thought we were talking to her. We were talking to the drugs, because that was when she was feeling good. Well, that's the insidious thing about heroin, too. I mean, once you become addicted, you're not normal unless you're on it. So that when we thought she was normal, normal had become a junkie. For parents, it's the hardest thing to understand how their kids get lost in the world of drugs. Self-destruction should mean just that. Unfortunately, it affects others as well. You raise children until they hit puberty, and they hit puberty, and then you wake up one morning and there's a different kid hugging you and telling you good morning. I grow so many in my veins every day. I never thought I would be addicted to heroin, like, never, ever. Danielle was just the most incredible social advocate. Before Danielle started doing heroin, I thought if a parent does education, if a parent is conscientious, if a parent pays attention to their kids, if a parent knows where their children are, who they're hanging out with, then I'm safe. I thought I was safe. I thought my kids were safe. Don't believe a word your child is telling you. Ever. <laughs> now, well, what comes to mind when I hear heroin is it can happen to anyone. I think because all those things were in my life already, it was a way, hey, you know, this person seems to be happier doing it at that time. So you want to try it. The sad thing about escapes is they don't take you anywhere. People were doing it around me. So I kind of felt, well, should I try it? It wasn't like, come on, try it, try it. It wasn't heavy peer pressure. It was just there and everyone was doing it. So I, I think I kind of took it on, internalized it and said, you know, well, if they're doing it and they're cool, maybe I should. Oxycontin takes about 45 minutes to work. Heroin takes about five minutes. And heroin, you're instantly warm, and it's instant euphoria. Amanda was, my oldest, was probably 15. My youngest would spend a lot of time at my mother's. My daughter knew. And a lot of times she would take care of the other kids. And my husband, who was also an addict, took care of the kids. And sometimes they did think I was working at night. Sometimes I would be out. I would start at maybe 3.34 in the afternoon, and I'll get home till 3.34 in the morning. Make seven or 800 bucks a day, enough to support your habit and your household, and put groceries in the cupboard, make sure the kids have clothes. This educational film shows what happens when you stop using heroin. For days, the body convulses uncontrollably with vomiting and diarrhea and legs kicking in the air. That's why they call it kicking the habit. Fifteen, twenty bags a day, if not more, and you can't stop. You're deathly ill if you do. You don't dare ask for help. And it's not even a point of being happy anymore. It's just something you absolutely have to do. Or, or you are so sick, you just want to die. It just got really serious really fast. Heroin leads to lies, deceit, dishonor, shame. When an addict comes down off an opiate, they get physically ill. And there's no threat of jail that's going to scare them at that point when they become so physically ill that you can't function. If I feel sick, I, will, I won't stop. There's no way that I'll stop. It's the worst flu that you'll ever have except worse. It starts off, you know, probably your, your first day into it, you're a little achy. Your nose will run and you'll sneeze. And you might have a little bit of the jitters and sweat. And your second day, uh, you begin to get diarrhea. And you throw up, and you're sweating uncontrollably and shivering at the same time. You can barely walk. All you want to do is cry. You have nothing to throw up because you can't eat, but you can't stop throwing up. Do anything you possibly can to get anything to make you feel better. I've never let myself go any longer than two days. Call up and make a phone call to a John or whatever or a friend and say, if you get me this, I'll do this for you. You know, I'm so sick, please help me and I'll do this for you. And that's, that's how it starts. You crawl, you walk, you drive, you make phone calls, you beg, you plead, you cry. You'll make a deal with the devil. And 
it happens over and over and over again and pretty soon you hate yourself so bad that you're doing this terrible thing for a drug habit it doesn't matter anymore now you're doing more dope and that's i think why a lot of women and girls turn to prostitution and stealing because anything to be sick you will do anything not to feel that feeling you want to curl into a ball and just die it's so awful they'll steal from anyone or anything anybody if you're a junkie and you're a prostitute too you want to make sure your kids have the best of everything because you compensate that way and say well at least my kids are dressed really good then you can rationalize anything what we saw is we saw students we saw athletes we saw non-athletes we saw exceptionally smart and talented people and we saw people that were just average it, it did not uh, discriminate based upon socioeconomic classes it did not discriminate based upon abilities it was a wide-scale accepted use of this type of drug my grades went down and I actually was put into an alternative education program a lot of people in there were drug addicts and I was introduced to heroin and uh, I loved it from the first time I tried it, I loved it. I think the addict in me convinced myself to do it. And I ended up going to get money and got a bag and sniffed it, got sick, got really, really sick. My first time I was like deathly ill. I remember driving home to my mother's house and uh, having to pull the car over with my friend because I was throwing up. That's the insanity. I didn't even, I didn't even feel high. And all night long, I would race back and forth to the bathroom. My mom had no idea what was going on. So how soon after that did you try it again? The next day. How long did it last? A few seconds. It's hard to explain, but it's, it's warm and it's a happy place and it's, it's better when you're high. You get a really warm rush. The rush is so intense that it knocks you right off your feet. It's, it was scary, but I loved it because it was so intense. And, you know, with sniffing heroin, it wasn't like that. And this is instant. I felt cool. I felt like um, I was on top of the world when I was doing it, although I felt so sick. It was, it, it's the insanity of the disease. Heroin is an escape. Heroin is, is not a cure. I would do a couple bags before I went to school. Go to school, I'd do bags at school. On lunch breaks, I would do fine in the beginning. I would nod out. I felt like I was doing fine, I could function. Everyone was using. We had off-campus lunches so we could go wherever we wanted for lunch. They would go smoke pot and come back right high. You know, people are nodding out, people are shooting up in the bathroom. Either the teacher was really ignorant to drugs or he just didn't, he just turned a blind eye to it. Open your eyes and see this epidemic. It's their job, it's their duty. If they don't pay attention, I mean, they are with them more than their parents. If they don't pay attention, these children are gonna become addicted and eventually die. They're our next generation. It is our problem. She told me that every time that she shot up after the first time was looking for that first time high, and she never got it. The only heroin high that provides any pleasure is that first high. And is it worth it? Is it worth it to stick that needle into your arm? I told you she was fire. And into your body? Oh, my God. My hands are shaking. When nothing that you do after that will ever match that high. You release the tourniquet and it's like, bam. God, I hate this thing. I was taking a whole teaspoon, putting it in the bag, and just doing it that way. I wouldn't even, it was raw heroin. I wasn't just cutting open bags and, you know what I mean? It, that would take way too long. The first time high is a lie. I was homeless. Um, I was in a really abusive relationship. I didn't have a car, and it was the dead of winter. We would sleep in friends' cars. We would sleep anywhere, go couch hopping. It was heart-wrenching, and it was horrible. My family didn't know where I was. <clears throat> they couldn't find me. Every now and then, I would call my mother, 
want money or need a place to stay. Never felt safe. It had just completely consumed my every thought. Moodiness began in eighth grade. Uh, I hate myself. I'm fat. I'm stupid. I'm ugly. And Danielle being insecure and needing attention and not knowing who she was at the time got caught up with the wrong crowd. She began to practice self-mutilation, which is cutting and scratching into your arms. The first thing I found out that she had used marijuana at that time. She was caught. And then I began an advocacy to try to get her help. The first time that I found out that Danielle was actually using heroin, she was 16 years old and she was found uh, sometime before 8 o'clock in the morning on Main Street in Bangor. Uh, with no pants and no underwear on, unconscious, taken to the hospital. Heroin and other opiates were found in her system. She had been gang raped and uh, had alcohol poisoning. I was amazed. Mortified is a better word. These are all... These are all packets of empty packets of do or die heroin. You know, I'm used to finding oh, a dozen or so around, and that was pretty scary. But when you think about her shooting all of this junk. So how many times a day would you shoot up? <sighs> all day. All day long. One right after the other not caring if it was too much. And I, I started to build <clears throat> such a high tolerance to it that I, was, I would have to go to Massachusetts and get um, large quantities of it. Because it, just buying a bag here and there, it wasn't doing it anymore. This category of drugs are so strong and they adversely impact your body's chemistry, your body's own ability to, to maintain that homeostasis, that level of balance among all your hormones and chemicals. It adversely affects that. Uh, to some extent, people cannot reproduce their own natural painkillers anymore. I went through a whole other phase of cocaine addiction after my heroin addiction. You know, I would do a lot of coke. Um, I've seen suicides, I've seen murders, I've seen everything. I went as far as mixing a bag of heroin and a half gram of cocaine and mixing it up, putting it in a needle and shooting it. Heroin slows your heartbeat. Cocaine makes your heartbeat increase. That's just a lethal combination. It's lethal. I lost a lot of weight. I was already skinny to begin with. I dropped down to about 90 pounds. I was sick all the time, my nose was running, I was throwing up if I didn't have it. It takes away the essence of humanity, it takes away the pleasure, the joy of human existence. It's death, and it's overdosing, and it's sickness, and it's, it's disease. As a mommy, you ended up being a dolphin by some jerk who uh, left me on the street and went to jail and left me with nothing, like I didn't even know which way to turn. Left me nowhere. I had a five hundred dollar a day habit, and so I had to go out and shoplift every day by myself. I mainly used my arms. At one point, I would try to go down in my wrists because my arms were so raw. I've seen it all from genitals to breasts to neck. I actually did try it in my neck once, and I would never do it again because it's in one of your main arteries, and it's just... To inject drugs into that is crazy, and it was so intense, I thought I was dying. I dropped to my knees and thought I was dying. The guy got me out working on the street, and the naive person that I was, he uh, was giving me heroin. He got me barred without me realizing it. And uh, the whole time, he knew what he was doing. 
See, I'm not a street person. I was raised properly with a nice family and money, and this is the last place uh, any of us expected me to be. And finally, it ended up to the point where I didn't know it, but I was junk sick. What do you mean by junk sick? You need too much heroin if you don't get it. You don't use it. You get sick, very violently sick. And uh, you have to have it. Otherwise, uh, you're not normal until you get it. Right now, um, I'm addicted to speedballs, which is heroin and cocaine. I wish the hell I wasn't. What is that in your uh, This is from... Not from dirty needles or anything like that. It's from drugs that were bad and they had a strange cut in them when doing drugs in that when it, you know when it was trying to heal. You'd stick but your yeah, hypodermic yeah, needle yeah. full of drugs yeah, in there. Yeah, I'd say this is my needle with my drugs, I'd be sticking it in there. That life is just horrible. And it's no way to live. But looking back on it, my body was shutting down every time I shot drugs. That rush that I was feeling was my body shutting down. It was poison. Danielle was not in the home when she was using heroin. I could not afford my other kids being exposed to that. But she called me at one point and said, I'm clean. I can show you my arms. And I said, well, that's very nice. Um, would you be willing to take off your shoes and show me between your toes? My parents thought that I could only shoot up either between my toes or there. So whenever they would look to see if I had track marks, they would like look right here and they would never look right there. And they always missed that. So he's got away with it. They were always like, well, we're glad to see you're doing well. And I was just like, yeah, <laughs> I'm doing great. Yeah, I used my arms, my track marks to get bad at one point. Back when I was using, I loved him. It was crazy. I would go to a store and I would put my arms in a certain position where people could see my track marks. That's not something I want to show off today. The advice that has often been given about heroin or other opiates is don't even do it once. Don't even try it once. I was using with my father. We were going to Massachusetts together so he always knew where I was. It didn't matter to him. I lived with him my freshman year in high school and he was very straight edge very straight edge. I wasn't allowed to hang out with boys. I wasn't allowed to smoke. Nothing. And then eventually I got kicked out of his house for drinking excessively. I got introduced to heroin. I ended up going into um, a local rehab for three weeks, detoxed at 16. He came to pick me up and when he was signing the papers I was out in his car and saw a blade. And of course I licked it. I tasted what was on it, and it was it was heroin. And I was blown away. My father was prescribed Oxycontin for about three years. And I think that's what started it, is eventually they cut him off. And he had, he had to find a way to get something or he would be sick. That really started the whole situation of me and my father using. And he saw money in me, and I saw money in him. Not to say he would prostitute me, but he knew that I could get him drugs because I was a young girl. It was disgusting. My mom was devastated by my actions. At one point, she'd even called funeral homes and made arrangements. They pretty much believed I was dead. And if I wasn't yet, it was coming. I ended up in prison and I spent three years there because of my addiction. And uh, I came home and... I messed up again and I went back to prison for another year and I got out and this time I just finally decided that you, it's, it's not even about quitting the drug, it's about quitting that lifestyle altogether. Amanda was my oldest. She was around a lot of, she saw a lot of things. She was around a lot of people and because she had some of, of the same experiences in her life that I did and a lot of the same emotional, the pain. Uh, she was looking for a crutch too. Unfortunately, my daughter became a heroin addict too. She got very thin and wouldn't eat. And uh, she was doing a lot of things, she was prostituting. I became aware really quickly that 
kids my daughter's age, juniors and seniors, were actually dealing it in the schools, making runs to Massachusetts, the ones with cars. Um, at her worst point in her life, I wasn't there for her because I was incarcerated in the prison that she's at now. She's been an IV user for um, a year and a half, two years now, and she has hepatitis. How did it start with her? Snorting um, Oxycontin. It began a long time ago just with Oxycontins and getting high before school and after school and with a boyfriend and things like that, and then it progressed to the heroin. Rarely ever did drugs by myself um, because the way I did drugs, I did drugs to overdose. That was my favorite feeling in the world. It's not just getting a little high, but going to the extreme where I dropped to my knees. I've myself overdosed in a Dunkin' Donuts bathroom, speedballing with an Oxycontin and a half gram of Coke. Well, like I said, not on heroin. She was almost, I guess you could call it codependent, just very loving and caretaker -y and beautiful and creative and talented. She put pins through her arms in front of her sisters who were at the time uh, seven, nine, and 11, and said, if you don't steal cigarettes from mom for me, if you don't steal money for me, I'm going to do this, I'm going to hurt myself. Use anything within her means and her power to get the drug. But Danielle made that choice. And at the one point that she made that choice to put that needle in her arm, she made her family, who I know she loves and cares very much about, deep inside of her heart, she made us the victims of choices that were beyond all of our control. At 14 years old in this country, children have confidentiality rights. So if they say at 14, I don't want anything to do with her, the parent being me, and they're in a program, then the parent gets no information, only the information that the child says that the parent can have. My biggest disappointment is uh, the Department of Human Services. I can't quite quote it, but her response was, a 16-year-old child who chooses to use illegal drugs and live on the street, who is not being abused in the home, is not something that this department deals with. So Danielle was shooting up heroin, and if I had been beating her, she would have been worth helping. Whose responsibility is that? If it's not the Department of Child Protection, Child protection should include protection from children who are wounding themselves. Does all child abuse have to be at the hand of a parent? Where, where is the help then for this kid? I mean, there are children on milk cartons that people are looking for. They don't know where they are. I knew where this kid was for, for three years, all through the Bangor area. Homeless, sleeping on benches, sleeping under viaducts. These children should be protected from whatever the perpetrator is, even if it's themselves. It feels fun, it's not. It's my firm belief that the pregnancy is what saved her. Uh, actually, she was using heroin when she got pregnant and came home and detoxed. So I had the honor of being able to be with her and go through those horrible, wretched withdrawals. And then the honor also of helping to deliver my granddaughter. And she's keeping Danielle hopeful for now. But Danielle still needs help because she can't hide behind her role as a parent to replace the heroin. The baby cannot be a replacement for the heroin. I was busted in April 2004. I was busted at my mother's house, burglarizing it. My sister was there and she saw how I looked, how sick I looked, and um, left and called my mother. And from there, they called the police. I was out for probably a couple days, and I was arrested again for some thefts of my mother's wedding ring. That time, I didn't get out. I found out the same day that I was pregnant, the same day that I went to jail, I found out I was pregnant. I was released to a rehab under house arrest. So I, I ended up keeping her at that point in time just to save myself from going to prison but then falling right in love with her and my life changed. They taught me a lot of things. They taught me a lot of coping skills. And when you're in a setting like that, and I mean, it's recovery 24 hours a day. It's nonstop.
And that's exactly what I needed, and I would recommend that to any addict. I don't feel that 30 days is enough when you've been using hardcore drugs for years. If it is not arrested, it gets worse until you die. You don't see an 80-year-old man or woman shooting up dope that's been shooting up dope since they were 20. You don't see that. So I got my own apartment, which is in a housing complex. I'm going for my nursing license something I really want to do. I really want to specialize in drug abuse. A lot of my time is taken up with a brand new baby and trying to stay clean is just hard. No matter what, I will never be recovered. Um, I will never be able to use drugs again. My daughter has, I have seen some of her close friends OD. She's lost a lot of friends. My daughter is currently incarcerated in the women's prison in Maine. Because of her heroin use, she was stealing. She was on probation. She couldn't stop using for anything. She, she went to rehabs. She's been through counseling. Uh, and she just couldn't stop using. And finally, they, after pleading and begging to do something with her, they finally put her away because we thought she was going to die. Don't know me. My name is uh, Sergeant Chris Martin. I'm a, uh, I'm a patrol supervisor. Chris Martin was the police officer responsible for Brewer High School at the time. When I hooked up with him, he listened to me. He is the first person that actually listened to me and heard me and felt what I was going through. The amount of assistance that he tried to give me were phenomenal. All through these law enforcement agencies, I've come across gems of human beings who are trapped within the structure that they have to move within. It's an everyday problem. It needs to be addressed every day. Once you slack off. We need to educate prosecutors. We need to educate judges. We need to educate defense attorneys. We need to educate teachers, students, parents, churches entire communities because once everyone has an understanding of what the issue is and the significance of the issue then we all share a responsibility in correcting it so with education will come accountability and with accountability hopefully will come responsibility I think that our best hope in winning the war on heroin is getting the word out not just saying it's terrible and you shouldn't use it but having people understand how it works so subtly on the brain this has been a learning experience for me. I didn't really understand what the various drugs were about. The significance of knowing what's happening around you, opening up the information pipeline. You need information flowing in. With the flow of information, you're going to identify targets. You're going to stay abreast of recent trends and techniques, and you're going to, it's going to empower you to do your job better. First of all, we need to know what's happening across the country because we're going to be, able to be able to predict what's going to be happening in our region by knowing what's happening in the country, what's happening in the New England area, what's happening in southern Maine and northern Maine. I can make some educated predictions as to what my department may or may not be facing. You know, I had seen, I've been involved in drug enforcement for about 10 years, and I had seen firsthand how different drugs had sort of cycled in and eventually cycled out of the community and, and the types of people that those drugs typically tended to affect, um, but we hadn't seen anything like this, but we did know enough about it to know that it wasn't a problem that was just going to go, go away. The very first step is to educate the public as to the nature and scope of the problem. Discipline is part of the principal's role. Too many times people are in denial. They don't want people outside of school to know. They don't realize that school is nothing more than a reflection of the total society. There's a drug and alcohol problem in society. Therefore, there is in school. My definition of a drug problem at my school, as long as I had one kid adversely affected by their use or someone else's use of drugs and alcohol, we had a problem. I think enough parents and enough teachers and counselors were starting to see this problem that they felt it was important to get the word out. When my kids were at school, I knew all 900, and I made it a point to know them. And they knew that when they came to school, they could walk in the office, walk into my office, sit down and say, we need to talk. Once you admit there's a problem and you're not afraid to do that, 
then you've got to develop the plan. I was fortunate. Uh, I ran across Chris Martin at the Borough Police Department. And Chris is probably the most knowledgeable local law enforcement officer uh, in this area, if not in the state. Uh, too many times, law enforcement and educators don't communicate. We put together uh, a plan called School Resource Officer, which is now quite prevalent across the country. Well, back in the mid-90s, it wasn't, uh, or at least not in this area. The importance of a school resource officer with respect to maintaining a safe school uh, and addressing opiate issues, opiate abuse issues, is critical. Your school resource officer must be trained in the identification of what the drug is, the drug paraphernalia, signs of abuse. Your school resource officer must try to open up that information pipeline to train up the faculty. Get the faculty trained as to the symptoms of impairment. Train the janitorial staff, train the, the kitchen staff, train anybody who has contact with these, with these students so that they know what to look for. My expectation is the frontline people in a school for observation and information about drugs and alcohol are the educators. Talk to students. Give presentations within classrooms. Talk to students one-on-one. -on -one, and you'll be surprised at the, at the level of intelligence that you will glean as to who's doing what or, or what the trends are. We would get anything from denial to a breakdown in tears and saying, I need help. Kids are a hard group to reach. And, and if they sense that you're making something up or lying about something, no matter what you say throughout the program, if they pick up on something that's not true, they'll dismiss the whole thing. Again, that message can't be, if you use heroin, you're going to die and you'd be a body bag, because that kind of message doesn't resonate very well. It doesn't mean anything to somebody who doesn't accept that or doesn't believe that, or they see their friends use and their friends aren't dead. I mean, I heard uh, a number of stories of kids who would come up to me after the program and say, you know what, I've got a friend who's been using this, and until we saw it up on the screen or until you talked about it, we didn't really realize that it was a problem, but it is. Stories of kids just walking up and saying, thank you, I will never ever try that. And, uh, and parents, you know, would come and say, I'm going to be a lot more cautious about what's going on and curious about what my kids are up to. And the, in order to make this work, it has to be daily, yearly, forever. You know, kids are funny, they don't always express their emotions, but you hope that someone's sitting, you know, in the 10th row back saying, that's me. And always address it as a community problem. It's not school, it's not family, it's community. Bring their parents into that. Uh, involve their coaches, involve everyone within this, uh, within this young person's life that has a positive influence and make them part of the solution. I would say a, a lot of parents were in denial. It's awful tough to say, uh, my son or my daughter's uh, using drugs. You know, really at the time wasn't a program that law enforcement would typically be doing, but there was just no one else out there doing it for the better part of two years. Um, you know, we carried this program all over the northern tier of the state. School resource officers are in the position to do intervention work. And it works, and it will save lives, and it will keep kids safe, and it will prevent crimes from occurring. Well, I mean, I think as, as police officers and as law enforcement, one thing that you typically never forget is standing over, you know, the body of a child who has died suddenly or tragically. And for me, um, you know, standing over kids who have died of drug overdoses when they're 16, 17, 18 years old and having to watch their parents deal with that, um, you know, that's really what motivates you to sort of do something that is outside of the box. Chris agreed to come in and do a presentation at a faculty meeting. Walked in, put heroin, cocaine, Oxycontins right under their nose so they can see it. And I think that created an atmosphere where the staff said thank you. Thank you for training us. If you expect us to know what's going on, why is Fred falling asleep? And Fred smells a little, a little odd. What, what is that? You've given us the keys uh, to deal with. I, I do know that law enforcement doesn't hold all the answers to it. If we're going to have any success in combating this problem, it's got to be law enforcement, it's got to be education, and it's got to be treatment. Hit it again! Police search warrant! Police search warrant! Uh.
how the front door was barricaded with steel bars going across the top and the bottom of the door, so it made it a little more difficult to get in. You got needles on it? No. I don't get pulled. I ain't got nothing. Come and see my cousin. Who's your cousin? He's not here, I guess. Who's your cousin? What? Who's my cousin? Don't we have nothing? You don't need to have nothing to come to the dope house, G. This is a dope house. If you say this is your cousin, right there. All right? Stop f***ing around with me. You hear me? Mm -hmm. Used lottery tickets. Or it's commonly used to package heroin. They'll, they'll cut up a piece of this lotto pack, and, th and that's a call to paper, and that goes for... Uh, Ten dollars. Feel that? It's like wax paper. So th this won't uh, stick like regular paper. Some people initial it with a T. That, that's Tron's dope. Because it looked like a piece of wood, you know, when the elastic was tight. Yeah. And they'd hide joints in there. See how it's chunked up like that? Yeah. Raw heroin. You, you can't really do this raw heroin like this because you're going to end up dying. They'll, they'll snort it. But if, uh, if you start shooting up raw hair when you're gonna, that's why you get these ODs and all that. They gotta, you know, cut it up with uh, another, like a laxative. What is that? These are all packs of hair on hair. This is raw, uncut heroin. Now let's start opening Christmas presents. Some little baggies. What we do find out is that juveniles play a very big part of narcotic trade. They're not trusted enough a lot of times to deal with the weight because they can be intimidated by the older guys on the, on the street. So they, the big guys use the juveniles just to look out and pay them somewhere between 20, $25 to $50 a day to, to look out and, it's, and be lookouts and notify them when they're coming by using cell phones, two-way radios or whistles or um, just or do a, a certain signal when they see us coming. Was just your juvenile lookout today? Yes, he, I can um, I can hear him, but it was a little too late. We came up too fast, and he didn't get a chance to um, make his notification to the to the house. They were in there playing video games, <laughs> so we caught him off guard. What but, type of dope did you find? And we got um, heroin, um, lots of heroin, about fifteen thousand dollars worth of heroin, um, marijuana, the south end side. They used to transform these pills by taking out the powder inside the pills and put the heroin inside that. So when the police would come in, they would not know that there was the heroin. For a lot of times when we first started running across this, we would miss this. And then one day, um, we just got smart and took a good analysis on it, and that's what the heroin was. So anytime I see these type of um, capsules, I always confiscate them and go get an analysis done on them to see if they're um, containing um, any kind of narcotic. Based on your observations, you think that's heroin inside there? It could be, be like they've been tampered with. The numbers are shifted around on some of the pills, um, so they could have been um, tampered with. I don't know if they got a chance to do it or if they completed it, but they have been tampered with. So I'll find out when I get, get to the um, precinct. Did you have a, like an organization or did you just recruit kids just randomly? No, I was in a, I was in a gang, organized gang. With drugs comes violence. It's a war. Like they say, a drug war. How violent is it? You watch the news, somebody getting killed every day. I seen kids killed, I seen women killed, I seen a, men killed. Tell me what you think about this whole kids and selling dope thing. Kids and selling dope. Don't do it. The bottom line is don't do it. Because you're gonna pay with your life. You either gonna you either gonna die, you're either gonna be locked up, incarcerated, or either you're gonna be on the run for the rest of your life. What happens when the kids get if, if one of your runners or kids that you use get arrested, what do you do? We try to get them out, pay their bail, get them out. If they snitch, then we have to put them to sleep. I would insist that children went to school and that they were educated properly. Not just sent to a factory, not just sent to be babysat. The children were educated. How do you stop these drug dealers from recruiting kids? What would you suggest that we do to stop drug dealers like yourself from recruiting kids? 
Make sure your child educated. Know what he's doing. Look in his room. Go through his drawers. Some parents don't even know their kids selling dope. Really? They don't know they got guns in the in the uh, dresser drawer in their bedroom. They don't know they got a kilo in the bedroom up under the bed. An AK up under the mattress. Check your kids. See what they're doing. Know where they are. What would be the biggest thing you would say causes kids to sell dope? What's the biggest reason? Because they want to be like the next guy. They're impressed by all the things they see. Why did you choose your career? It should be a wake-up call because heroin is back. Young kids are using heroin. Things have changed uh, not just because of the drug problem, the illegal immigration problem. And sometimes there's a connection between illegal immigration and the drug traffic. You can't separate it sometimes. So we have a large problem now with illegal uh, immigrants coming into our country. I think there's over 10 million, and there's quite a few right here in Arizona. You will see where illegals have come into this area, targeted high schools in this affluent area, selling heroin. We've already arrested seven illegals coming up here to sell heroin to our young people in a fluent area because they have the cell phones, they have the Mercedes, and they have the money. I'll tell you one thing, the people of Scottsdale are gonna get a, get a message very soon about their kids, and they're gonna be outraged. And I'm not going to lock the kids up, I'm sending out 600 troops, my deputies and posse, and knock on every door of all those phone calls that were made and we're going to tell the parents by the way someone in this house made 50 phone calls to a dope peddler but you know, I just want to let you know and let's see what the parents do to their kids are they going to slam the door in my face don't come and accuse oh you accuse me or my kids of selling or buying heroin or are they going to say thank you Thank you for bringing this to our attention. We want to do something. Okay, let's get some education. Let's get some treatment. Let's do that for your kids. I don't want to put them all in jail. I was always high on something at school. This 18-year-old high school dropout got busted for buying heroin from an undercover detective. But the former Saguaro High School student insists there are dozens of classmates just like her who haven't been caught. I knew a lot of girls, like cheerleaders, who would do coke or they do meth to get skinny. And they do it in the bathrooms. Like, I'd walk in on people and I'd hear them, like, snorting stuff. The teenager came clean during an interview with Maricopa County Sheriff's investigators who found out for themselves what the teen was saying was true. This is our future, our young people, and heroin is the worst drug you can use. Today, Sheriff Joe Arpaio announced the results of an eight-month investigation into the sale and use of heroin in Valley Schools. With the help of undercover detectives, 18 current and former students, mostly from Scottsdale, were arrested. But authorities found the drug problem stretches all across the valley. This weekend, sheriff's deputies and posse members will go door to door to more than 500 homes where they believe a possible young drug user is living. We're there to educate, to save these kids if they have a problem. And I just hope that the parents cooperate. All of the names in the sheriff's drop-by list came up during the course of the sting operation as either a suspected drug user or someone who made frequent calls to a drug dealer. This former heroin addict never got any help until detectives took her away in handcuffs. I'm sad to say that some of my friends do do it. <laughs> um, they, don't, they don't do it at school, but off campus they really do. Just two students at high schools, the sheriff says, are targets of opportunity for drug dealers. All day, deputies fanned out from a Scottsdale Road command post. We were not allowed in the visits because of privacy issues. 
A couple of parents did show up to see what it was all about. One told me he thinks it's easy for parents to be caught by surprise. In this situation, you know, a policeman knocked on your door and said, uh, your child's been in contact with, uh, you know, a major drug dealer here in town. Did you know about that? Oh, that would be a big eye opener. I think I would scare the heck out of me. The sheriff claims the reason for these door-to-door -door contacts is not for discipline, but to open people's eyes and offer them a way to help. We're not going into the house accusing them. We're just saying that your phone came up and that's why we're here. Students at some of the schools involved had mixed reviews. I think it's a pretty good idea, just so the parents know what's going on with what the kids are doing, and to let them know that something's going around. It's just a fact of society, and if they don't bring it up with their children, and they don't discuss it with them and tell them tell them this stuff, then it really kind of... They, they really don't deserve to know about it because they really don't know their children that well. The sheriff's office figures getting the word this way is better than having their child called off to jail. In Scottsdale, Mike Levitt, CBS 5 News. Years ago, heroin was somewhat into the minority areas. It was a drug of choice when I first came on the job. It was the most vicious drug. You didn't hear about methamphetamine and very little cocaine, except it was involving the musicians. Things have changed. The first step that we did as an agency is we developed a zero tolerance policy. The second thing is we developed a very stern reputation in the community that we will not tolerate this type of abuse. The first step that agencies need to do as far as strategies for combating opiate issues and drug-related issues with uniformed officers is to get them trained up. Some of the techniques that I'm going to talk about today you can get through the multi-jurisdictional counter-drug task force training free of charge. They provide tuition-free training across the country and they're one of the premier drug training facilities in the nation that I know of and had the privilege to work with. Get out there and talk to your clerks that work in the convenience stores. Get to know the, the people who work the front desks at the hotels and the motels. Get to know the janitors at the high schools. We do hotel motel interdiction and we've turned out very good cases out of that. We trained up the hotel motel owners and staff as to behavior uh, signs that are consistent with drug traffickers. Uh, we train them on drug identification and recognition. You're going to be surprised. You will solve thefts. You will solve burglaries. You will solve burglary in a motor vehicle. Different detective divisions, they meet every single month and they share information. Specialized drug units meet every month, share information. Do patrol divisions do that? No, but you can. And we've done it here. 72 grams of heroin, $21,000 worth. Doesn't look like much, does it? If someone walks through this police department door and says, I'm a drug addict and I need help, I have to be knowledgeable enough about the treatment available that I can plug this person into a treatment service. I have no veins um, at any time or another when I have to even have a blood test drawn. They have problems doing that. Methadone clinics are the most highly regulated drug treatment intervention in the world. Our primary mission is to treat people with long-term chronic opioid dependency, opiate dependency, usually heroin. It has been traditionally heroin, although now many people come who are primarily using narcotic painkillers that doctors have prescribed and have been diverted. Our number one priority is to get the patient to stop using street opiates and the reason that that's our number one priority is because the, the, the personal and public health costs of a, of a person continuing to use opiates are extremely high. 80% of the people that we're treating in our program use drugs intravenously. They shoot them up. When you do that, it creates a tremendous number of medical problems. Things like HIV and hepatitis C, 
Um, there's also high risk, so overdose. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. We think HIV is a problem. Hepatitis C amongst injection drug users, um, when they get done with all of the studies that they're doing, I think is absolutely going to boggle people's minds. So a lot of the focus for many methadone programs is really um, trying to prevent serious medical consequences that are related to the ongoing opiate use of the person that they're treating. And the way that we do that is to use a medication like methadone that um, allows the person to kind of leave that drug usage and enter into a healthier um, and, and less risky lifestyle. Methadone works in exactly the same way. It's a replacement for a neurochemical, a, a chemical that you need in your brain in order to function normally. And that's why it works the way that it works. That's why we use it for uh, what we call replacement therapy. That's the technical term for methadone treatment. The way that, that I really think about it is, is that it's very similar to someone if they're diabetic. If you're diabetic, your pancreas isn't functioning normally, your blood sugar isn't, isn't regulated appropriately, and so you're sick, you can die from that. The reason that, that methadone is not just trading one drug for another is because methadone is an entirely synthetic narcotic. I, I would say that our approach um, is a very comprehensive one in many respects. Um, we tend to look at opiate addiction as a psychiatric disorder, that it's chronic, meaning that it lasts over the lifespan of the person once they've used opiates for six months to a year and, and had this neurochemical change. I think one of the things that people don't understand is methadone is not a drug treatment. Methadone is a medication for a physiological disorder that you have that was caused by opiate usage. Methadone by itself will help re-regulate your, your brain chemistry and it may allow you some degree of relief from the problems that you had before but it won't take care of every problem that you have. It's not, a, it's not a magic bullet. All the other things that you do, like individual counseling, occupational rehabilitation, um, nutritional counseling, learning how to re-regulate your sleep, all these things that we work on with people, those are drug treatment. That's what really matters in terms of having good long-term outcomes with people. Overall, though, I think the thing that we really focus on that may be different in our program than it is in some is, what I would call functionality. How functional is the person after they've been in treatment with us for six months as compared to when they enter treatment with us? Out of all the addictions that I had, um, I finally stopped doing heroin, I went to methadone and... It's very difficult to get off methadone. And I would say, kind of roundabout way I'm getting at, the limitation, I think one of the limitations of methadone is, is that once you're using it as a medication to stabilize on, it takes a long time to come off it in a way that doesn't risk relapse for you. And that's just the nature of the, it's just the chemical nature of the drug. It it's not something you can go off of quickly. It has to be done very slowly. Um, and I think that's a very big frustration for many patients and many family members. When I came off methadone, I was on methadone for almost three years. It took me six months to be able to just really sleep or eat normally not have the chills and think straight. It was, it was six months before I felt any kind of normal. You know, in the United States, there's about 200, 250,000 methadone treatment slots, so to speak, people in methadone treatment. And all those programs are pretty much at capacity. We're not keeping pace with the number of people who are asking us for help. The philosophy of the drug court program reflects the fact that the uh, addicted uh, defendant is different than the person who's simply a career criminal. And uh, we've discovered traditionally in the past that uh, the typical sanctions we have in the state of Maine, including sentences or probation, standard supervised probation, weren't getting the job done. So what we've tried to do is identify those individuals who have some insight into their addiction, uh, whose criminal acts are not suggestive of really sort of being a career type of a criminal giving them opportunity to just warp ahead in their recovery, make some important changes in their lives, uh, take themselves out of the criminal sphere, and uh, by doing so avoid uh, uh, filling the jails and uh, the usual sanctions involved with criminal offenses. To be blunt, you know, heroin addicts are not everybody's favorite poster child. They are often highly stigmatized people who have what I believe to be a serious physiological disorder and a lot of the behaviors that make people angry and unhappy with heroin addicts are not, they're not
chosen behaviors, they're not volitional, right? They do this because of the psychiatric disorder that they have. I am just scared out of my wits just looking at it. 10, 12 years ago, it was a shocking thing to have a heroin case on the docket. It, was, it, was, it made the news, it was a big deal. Now they're absolutely routine. I think we're having better understanding as a society as to what this particular class of drugs is doing to us from a criminal point of view. Uh, we tell our folks when they enter the drug court program that before they, they graduate, they'll have to make their way to recovery. That's the central piece. They need to have employment in the mainstream employment field. They need to have uh, independent housing, not relying on someone else for their housing. They have to have stable relationships. They basically have to be functioning members of society. If we put our extra resources and our extra attention toward the addicts and toward those who are committing all these crimes and we tackle the drug issue, we're going to be able to solve our crimes because we're going to know or have a good idea who's committing them and we're going to drive the crime out of our community. As a judge, when I see people come before me in criminal cases, I keep professional distance. The problem with drug court is we drop that distance. I call all these people by their first names. I speak informally. I know what's going on with their lives. It's a real emotional roller coaster ride for the judge, which is not typically the way it works in, in general court. Traditionally, when addicts were arrested and brought in the criminal justice system, they're put in the jail. Uh, there typically is no effort to um, detox them in any sort of therapeutic setting. They pretty much went cold turkey. And of course, while all that was happening, the only thing you could think of was getting back on the drug again to get those terrible feelings away. It's a very strange dynamic that takes place in drug court. It's almost as though Judge Murray and I have become parent figures. The case manager becomes an older brother or sister. And then the law enforcement people, the people on the team, become extended family. And uh, I find myself being very parental. You have to completely put all of that aside and make a choice. You know, uh, those people have to go. And you need to either find new people or none at all until you're ready. When people graduate, when they make it through the program, they've made it to recovery. And we have a court session and family members are present in the courtroom and there are you know, hugs and tears and everybody's happy and you get stories from, from spouses and parents and siblings about the fact that they thought this person was going to be dead. Everyone in our program says, I wish I never did it in the first place. They understand. Because of the choices I made by accepting drugs in my life and doing drugs and being an addict and becoming a felon, I lost a wonderful job. I've been turned down jobs and I've not been able to get employment because of choices that I made. I first uh, dealt with Sharon on a professional basis back in 1997. And what I saw was a lifetime, a lifetime pattern of abuse, use. And to see where Sharon is, Sharon is another success story. Sharon has greater obstacles ahead of her and Lindsay. Um, nobody hires felons. How can they get a job? How can they live? Have, have we made it a winnable situation for them or have we created a lose, losable situation in which they're going to be more likely than not to go back to their old ways? It's different now. I'm really glad it's over. <clears throat> um, I wouldn't change anything that I've done because I learned a lot. Sharon's state of being, her state of mind, how she views herself, how she views her life and her past mistakes uh, is truly extraordinary. <clears throat> We're people. I had an officer give me a chance and um, became my friend. And that makes a big difference. I wasn't just a junkie. I was a person, and um, I don't think that I would have, you know, still today been wanting to work so hard at what, what I'm doing now if I hadn't have had that kind of uh, friendship with this person and with the people that I had experiences with in the police department because um, it, they did treat me like a human being. You want your officers to be aggressive enough with the drug problem, but in the same token, we can't lose sight of the fact that 
These people are human beings. They're human beings that are suffering. I am now diagnosed with HIV since 91. It's going on nine years. I, how I got it was through using somebody else's uh, needle. When I found out, the first thing I thought to myself was I wanted to kill myself. Then my kids came flashing into my head. I came. They're human beings that are... Yes, they're victims of their own choices. They are victims of choices that they made. Now, you're back from the dead, sir. But currently, when you deal with them... Do I just sit there for a minute? Yeah, my throat is in... You know what? You're okay. Their life is out of control. It is spiraled, spiraled downhill and down so far that they don't know which way is up. After all the damage I did to myself, I never in a million years would have thought I would make it that far. Where Lindsay is today and where Lindsay was a year and a half ago is unbelievable. She is just short of a miracle. I didn't expect her to live. I really believe that today in my program, honesty is the biggest key to recovery. Without honesty, you have nothing. Without my honesty in my life today, I have nothing. Being a mother, is the most rewarding, the most painful, the most up, the most down, the most thankless, and the most gratifying job that I will ever, ever do in my entire life. Shelly, as a parent, I truly feel for what she has gone through. Her story is, is, has been a, a painful one. It, it looks like there, there could be a, a, a decent ending to this, but you just can't describe the pain and torment that a parent would go through. You have to ask them the questions about what they're doing and what they know and who they know and be educated yourself, get as much information as you possibly can. The other thing that you can look for is different types of paraphernalia, uh, spoons that are bent that have burnt marks underneath them and, and some type of uh, powder residue inside the actual bowl portion of the spoon. The housings of pens that have been cut in half, razor blades, plates that have a powder residue on them, mirrors that have a powder residue on them, or even needles. They hide their track marks. Uh, it may be in the sweltering summer heat and you may see somebody who's very emaciated and pale, thin. Um, their eyes may appear very droopy and basically like they're on desk doorstep and they'll have a long sleeve shirt on. Educate yourself. Get on the internet. Go to the library. Go to the police station. Go to whatever resource you're comfortable with and educate yourself. Talk to your kids. I was never talked to. My parents never talked to me about drugs. It was just assumed that I knew. And I didn't. And just and look for the signs. There are signs. There really are. You know, you start straying away from your really good friends. Your grades go down. You start skipping school. And don't think that <clears throat> you're acting too extreme, because you never are. You're, you're better safe than sorry. Know who your kids hang around with. Know them personally. Know where they're going, where they're at, what they drive, what they wear, what they smell like when they come home. You know, any kind of relationship that you can have with them, if, even if they don't think you're cool, you know, spend time with them anyway. Understand the addict. Understand what it's like to be an addict. Living in a circle of fire. If the jail system hadn't taken me off the street, I probably would be dead today. Talk to an addict. Feel compassion for them. But it doesn't mean that we're weak on the drug stance. This disease is incurable, progressive, and fatal. If it's not arrested, it gets worse until you die. Oh, I would say to any parent that's going through this, you did nothing wrong. We can teach them, we can show them, we can guide them. The hardest part of parenting, but probably the most crucial part, is that at some point these kids have to be made responsible for their own choices. If I have to make sure nobody comes through my door and, you know, to totally block those people out and start a whole new life, that's what I'll do. But after you see this addiction, you know, go generation to generation. You yeah, have to stop it. it. I had to. Well, I honor her for her experiences, for the things that she suffered, for overcoming, for continuing to overcome. I would be devastated if my daughter ended up like me. Well, after having met a lot of folks who used heroin, people who treat it, 
the word just uh, strikes a chord of, of fear in my heart. There has to be hope. There has to be programs where people feel comfortable with, with everyone in the program. It's not a law enforcement problem. It's a human problem. These people are sick. And if these people are not having a good time, and that they get locked into a lifestyle that they cannot undo. As long as there are people out there who don't understand the profound danger, we can't win the war. People are dropping like flies around here now. I mean, every time you turn on the news, somebody's dying. I think it's important to, to hang in there with that person to the best of your ability, and at least emotionally support them, and continue to encourage them to enter treatment, even if they've had numerous treatment failures. They do better at the sixth treatment than they do at the first one. Hope and laughter are essential, and no blaming, no blaming. Um, choices and accountability. If you did every drug in the room and could still walk out, you were cool. And that's still true today for kids. It took me to my knees. It just saw, it let me see that it could too happen to me. I said, it cannot, and it could too, and it did. If you want to go through the hell that I went through, be my guest. You may not survive. I've seen people pull out of clubs, foaming at the mouth, ODing on the street corner, you know? Yeah, if we, if we had to go out, we were trying to target some dealers. Yeah, we would go to a club where they're raving. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a given. When I walked in the bedroom, I knew damn well you did. Don't believe a word your child is telling you. Ever. <laughs> yeah, they sell drugs anywhere. I mean, we got complaints where they sell it at fast food restaurants, car washes. I'm a dessert. He's at 140 for one. My tunnel speaks fast. Get you ready. You know, they say recovery is a journey, it's not a destination. And I hold very closely to that. I like who I am and where I am today. Sometimes when we talk about tough love, don't be afraid to take an addict to jail. They may have talked to you. They may have shared their life story with you. Don't be afraid to take an addict to jail because if the addict is in jail, a day of sobriety is a win. Ten days of sobriety is a win. Absolutely. Because it's going to keep some kids and it's going to keep people off the streets and there's not going to be disease passed around and the desperation's not there anymore. But it's very important also to remember that as far into the disease as you get, you have to come back that far into recovery. Take your wins wherever you can. Just hanging on the court playing b-ball When these drugged up bugs came out from behind the wall They said, you're no good, we're the best in this neighborhood With no delay, the game got underway The drugged up bugs were too high to play They couldn't even hold the ball Couldn't pass, couldn't shoot, couldn't score at all Couldn't find the paint In school they thought they was cool, but now they ain't That's the buzzer, time to quit Home B's 100, drug bugs zip The lesson here is so plain to see Drug free is the way to be You'll never forget the people you hurt when you were high. You can take a shot, take a turn, take a spin, take a look at him. Don't take drugs. You can take a walk, take a leap, take a slide, take a ride, ride, ride. So don't take drugs. Your brain gets dizzy, your body goes numb. So if you take drugs, well, that's, that's just, just dumb. dumb. You want to be strong, you want to live long. Don't take drugs. <laughs> It is my opinion that the death of Daniel C. Hurd is due to acute drug intoxication. The only drug present in her system was ecstasy.